Welcome to The Money Huddle, a podcast that explores financial topics for families and small business owners. Hosted by Michael Baker and Ross Marinell. All opinions expressed by Michael and Ross or any podcast guests are solely their own opinions and may not reflect the opinions of Planners Alliance. The podcast recording is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Planners Alliance may maintain positions and securities discussed on the program. Welcome back to the Money Huddle. My name is Michael Baker, and today, not only am I sitting here with my co-pilot, Ross Marinell, we have a very special guest with us, the Chief Investment Officer of Planners Alliance and Advisory Alpha, the man, the myth, the legend, Steve Osterink Jr. Oh man, what's Glad up, to dude? Be here. <laughs> Glad to be here. No better place than hanging out with you guys on the Money Huddle. Yeah. So <laughs> the fun thing about uh, this trip is Steve is down here hanging out with us. Uh, we're doing a couple of events, and uh, if you live in the South, you know that uh, we've had an un uh, unusual rainy season down here. It's been raining and pouring. Well, Steve's from Michigan, and as luck would have it, it's beautiful. Uh, it's been amazing for his trip down. So we rolled out the sunshine carpet for him. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Otherwise, I would never come back. <laughs> so, real quick, so what what's been your your first uh, initial takeaway from this this trip? Did you get you have you gotten yourself some good barbecue yet? No barbecue yet, but I suspect that's that's coming. But a lot of great client conversations and talking a lot about the markets and interest rates and everything going on. And I think that's uh, that's exciting stuff. Clients need to need to hear that kind of thing. No question about it. And you know, one of the things I think we want to talk about. And this is something that you know, when we do workshops and, and people come in and they actually see us do a, a talk live, one of the topics that we constantly try to uh, make more bring more clarity to i should say and crystallize for people is is the different language between like our industry and like what your average everyday person how they talk about investing and then how our industry talks about investing so for to give an example we talk about um risk you know for right. for an investor and when a lot of investors when they say i'm conservative you know, and I, I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose money. You know, what they really mean is that they don't want to lose money. And what of a lot of financial professionals say is like, oh, you just want more fixed income in your right. portfolio. Well, there's different, I mean, if you think about it from a, from a client perspective, every, it, it seems logical that there should be some way of, of knowing exactly what the markets are going to do. And when you make these comments about having a crystal ball and all that, everybody laughs and says, yeah, of course, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, you know. But at the end of the day, they think, hey, you're in the business. You're doing this all day long. You should know about the markets. You should know what's going on. And, hey, guess what? That means you're going to get me out at the perfect time and get me back in when things are good. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's just, it's not feasible. Nobody can do that. And so when we talk about risk, it's not about, how do we navigate these markets in a way to deliver no downside and all upside? That's not an appropriate, realistic understanding of risk. Risk, there, there are different risk management techniques and strategies that we can deploy, but it all starts with the plan. It starts with what are the financial objectives of the individual investor and how can we structure their financial resources in a way to best enable them to meet their financial goals that that's the first step. It's not about trying to time the markets and navigate this. That's it. Like I said, an inappropriate understanding of risk. So it is a very important topic. It's a very realistic topic that we deal with every day. And I think when we look at that, we have to somewhat protect clients from themselves to make sure they have an appropriate understanding of how this works right. mm -hmm. so that they don't get burned by some other advisor or somebody trying to do something, you know, screwy with, with, with their money. They just need to have an appropriate understanding of that. I agree. One of the things that we've seen, um, you know, we we've, we constantly get different stories from folks when we're when we're meeting with them, when when they come to an event, when they come to the office, we, you know, just in casual conversations out and about. There still seems to be this underlying belief in a lot of people that market timing is actually a real thing. That you know that there's there's some team out there that's got it figured out and you know they know all the right moves of getting 
you know, getting in and out of the market at the right time. And we'd love to hear your your just initial thoughts on people who have that mindset about investing. Well, so my first comment is, if you ask any financial advisor, or really I would argue pretty much any client today around, is it realistic for somebody to time the markets or to, to, to do market timing? Everybody's gonna say, no, there's, there's no way, it's not possible. Market timing doesn't. Nobody can do that. Like right. I, that's the that's the vernacular out there. People understand that, but it's that's the term market timing that people recognize as unrealistic. But if you peel back that onion and get in, into people's heads, like I was saying, around you know what their expectations are around money management and financial advisors, if you start asking enough questions, you'll find that a lot of the general population does feel like market timing is possible right. but they just don't call it market timing right. you know so it's it's really interesting you know and that's my point like i think market timing you have to be you call it whatever you want nobody calls it market timing anymore mm-hmm. just because it's un, it's an unpopular term right get me <laughs> out when things are bad get me in when things are good right yeah. right but the reality is i think if you get at the heart really of what people are looking for is they want to meet their goals okay and for a lot of people that's retirement income right. planning they want to meet their goals so if you look at how do i how do, I, how do we help clients achieve their goals in the most sustainable fashion, right? With the highest probability of success. Risk management is a very real thing that we need to be cognizant of because risk, not just market risk, I mean, there's all sorts of risks. Longevity risk, inflation risk, interest right. rate risk, all sorts of risks. But those risks can impair uh, an, an investor's financial journey and their retirement income plan. So we have to you know, be very cognizant around what we can do in the risk management realm, but market timing or whatever you want to call it, right? That's not how we're going to deliver risk management, but there are risk management strategies that are very important that we focus on every single day sure. to help investors prudently reach their financial Right. Goals, so if right? we if we can kind of agree that it's very difficult to time the markets, if not impossible, like you said, there are some ways that we can manage risk for our clients within a portfolio. Let's talk about some of the things that we can do. You bet. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've i been having this conversation more and more with with investors because at the end of 2018, markets sank, the world was going to end again, and hey, right. guess what? Hey, we're back. You know, markets are doing great. And we've, yeah, I've had, I've, I've had recent experiences where I've had dialogues with clients around, they, they got out of the markets late in 2018. Uh, they either had a, stop loss or they had some you know something in 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 play that got them out of the market right and then now i I, this particular client kind of sticks out my or prospect sticks out in my head that they're they're still not back in right Right. they got out towards the end of the year absorbed the bulk of the downside and and they're not back in. right so they caught the majority of the downside but not the full downside right but they're still now didn't participate in what's been a a pretty strong recovery from basically from the day after Christmas to now. Double digit, yeah, equity kind of returns, bounce back, and it's that's a scary thing and people don't realize, you know, this is one of the risks of market timing is so much of the long-term equity return is actually packed into a very short period of, of right. time. And you know, there's been different studies done. Hey, what are your what do your returns look like if you miss the you know five best days of the market? Yeah, the ten best trading days of the yeah. year. Right. You know. Yeah. You totally squash your long term return. So you know we've kind of beat that that horse to death just on market timing. It's just not a great real kind of like prudent strategy, I'll say, for risk management. But but your point, you know, w- what is okay? Yeah. And I think one of the there, there's a variety of things that that step out uh, pop out of my mind. I mean. Uh, the first that I'll talk about, ris- a true risk management technique, is I'll call it appropriate diversification. You know, I hate this term diversification because everybody overuses this term diversification right. to the point where it's it's funny. It's like you ask a client, right? Um, hey, is your portfolio diversified? It's like, what are they going to say? No, I, I love all my eggs in one basket. Right. You know, I'm not diversified <laughs> at all. You know, it's like everybody's going to say they're diversified. But when you look at how endowments and very large financial institutions allocate their financial resources, a lot of times it's very different than how retail investors allocate their assets. They're using different types 
of financial market exposures. So that's the first thing that I'll talk about, that I'll mention here is appropriate diversification is a powerful risk management tool when it's deployed correctly. Right. I like that term, appropriate diversification. We had someone tell us the other day they were a common sense conservative. I thought that was a good way yeah. to express their uh, investment risk profile. So appropriate diversification, different than just using a buzzword saying we cover all the bases. For yeah. Sure. And I think, you know, just to kind of, you know, piggyback on that point you made, you know, one of the things like one of our sayings here is, you know, we don't we don't evaluate portfolios. We evaluate plans because, you know, we want to be investing and, and using a the appropriate strategies within the context of a plan. Cause the, I guess the ultimate objective of the plan is to help you reach your goals. But um, one of the things, you know, we see a lot of times is people come in and they have their portfolios. And when we get into the analysis, they'll have a handful of funds, but then, you know, you, you, you know, when we kick it up to you guys and your team and we're like, Hey, you know, give us some feedback. We'll see that there's usually a high degree of overlap in a lot of the positions. So it's yeah. where, a lot of your retail investors or average investors, they think that they are diversified appropriately because right. they own a number of different positions. But then when you get into like the the ingredients that they actually are building those portfolios with, like actually no, you have a lot of exposure to you or know, a lot of funds that do kind of the same thing, exactly or in the same right. space, but it's a different name. Yeah, and and that's that's a little bit of a segue into maybe I'll say point number two on appropriate risk management is uh, I'll call it strategy level diversification, right? So when you say diverse appropriate diversification, I'm really talking about asset class exposure, investment markets, looking at U.S. stocks, foreign stocks, fixed income markets. Like that's most people's understanding of diversification. But when, when we talk about now point number two, strategy level diversification, this is where it gets really interesting because in, in the olden days, it was kind of like risk was viewed very one dimensional. What's your risk tolerance, Mr. and Mrs. Klein? And guess what? Here's your portfolio. Um, here's your mix to, to get you to your goals. Now, I think strategy level diversification, implementing different portfolio solutions or investment solutions or investment products intelligently, okay, based on risk, yes, based on risk tolerance, also based on what's the client's retirement income needs, portfolio withdrawals, time horizons, also based on their tax situation. Some portfolios are going to be more tax uh, sensitive or, or, or just better tax managed than others. There's these other factors now that are really core to a client's financial life where if we're not considering those, if, if, we're, if we're not using multiple strategies, then we can't adequately consider all of those factors in a client's financial life that should be considered when we're building their, their investment mix. So again, that's kind of my point number two. I think that concept of strategy level diversification, there's been different names for that bucket planning systems and other things but it's it's uh i think it's really important i mean that that helps maximize the clients really the the, i'll call it kind of the longevity of their retirement income plan or the sustainability of their retirement income plan it's it's very powerful and for most of uh you know for a lot of folks that we're meeting with they are in that what we call kind of retirement red zone a few years away Mm -hmm. uh from retirement or maybe just a few years in um, talk about some of the, the, the changes that you've really noticed from, a, from just that kind of mix, the importance of that really sort of you know, being magnified yeah. when someone starts to take or approach taking withdrawals. Well, yeah, and again, this kind of connects to this, the idea of strategy level diversification, but as you, there's this term uh, like sequence of, of return risk or um, just withdrawal strategy. Um, where as you start taking money out, I mean, that changes everything, really. Right. Right. I mean, now all of a sudden money's coming out. We're, we're forcing, we're, we're selling now our portfolio to, to live off of, and we can be forced to, to sell uh, out of the principal, and that, in effect, can lock in losses if markets are low. Again, that's a bit of a segue to my point number three, is I think this idea of yield appropriately using investment income right. is another form of risk management right. where there's different high yielding investments where if there's yield and, and take a step back total return when investors look at their statement and see their return it comes in two pieces income and growth 
Right. So we've got the portfolio income or yield, and then the capital appreciation or growth. Those yeah. two things together are total return. By appropriately using the income, if we have income portfolios that kind of feed the retirement income or the withdrawal needs, where we can shelter any withdrawals against that principal, right. that's a powerful risk management right. tool. And in today's environment, when it's difficult to find yield, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means you have to work a little harder to find it. But that's a that is is again another prudent risk management strategy. Yeah, I think you know it's kind of like one of the same one of the same concepts that people can be familiar with when they're growing and trying to build their nest egg. It, you know, we, we've heard the term used um, dollar cost averaging. You know, when people are constantly putting money into their 401ks, you know, the, the dollar cost averaging is, is you, you continue to buy in. And, you know, when, when the markets are down, you're going to buy your money's going to buy more shares versus when the markets are up. But, you know, over the long haul, that that's a that's a solid you know program. And I think may, maybe one of the main uh, benefits of it is just the discipline of saving. It, it instills, you know, constantly, you know, you're constantly saving. But that same concept kind of gets turned on its head a little bit where when you have volatile assets inside of a 401k and you're seeing, you know, mar- you know, market swings, ups and downs, highs and lows, and you've got money going to work for you in that time, the opposite is also true. Like, you know, it's right. like you just said, like, you know, when you have like uh, built in a strategy for how to take distributions and in income and retirement, you know, th- those assets that are highly volatile and maybe maybe positioned for long-term growth, those aren't the assets we want to be pulling money out of right. because we don't necessarily know what, what the market's going to be doing when we need our paycheck, you know, next right. year. And so I, I see that a lot. And I, I would like to hear you, your thoughts on like this, this, um, you know, this, another stance that we get from people from time to time is just when we talk about um, overall, like they the, the risk, of, you know, they, they did a risk assessment form and, you know, I've started to tell people like, you know, that, that risk form, what that does is a lot of times to me, that just tells me what your intentions are, but how people's emotions play into investing and, and their overall strategy and why it's important to, you know, make sure you, you've got these pieces in place where you've got your strategic diversification, you've got your plan built out because uh, ultimately when the markets test us, that's when our emotions are going to make us want to jump ship. You bet. Well, uh, a lot of a lot of investors, even professional advisors, don't really have a solid understanding of what goes into to risk tolerance. But to, to everyone's defense, the risk is a very subjective. It's a very subjective right. term, and it's a subjective process to arrive at what what is my true risk tolerance. The other thing is, if you if you look at then even even if there was a universal understanding of of r- what risk is. There isn't a universal understanding of which investments should be used based on the risk tolerance. And as an example right. of that, you know, target date retirement funds have become very popular right. across four hundred one k plans and and other things in the industry. And it's very interesting. I mean, these 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 funds they have a, a date attached to them based on when your anticipated retirement date is. So if it's a twenty thirty fund, that that means you're going to retire in the year twenty thirty, and that's how that allocation of that fund is kind of geared towards it. So as you re- approach retirement, it gets gradually more and more conservative in the fund as you near retirement. But I bring this up because if you look at, say, target date, uh, target retirement date fund from XYZ provider versus the same year target retirement date fund from ABC provider, what you're going to find is a different mix of stocks and bonds. Right. Same exact retirement, like 2030 <laughs> fund, but why does one of them have, say, 50% stocks and 50% bonds, but the other one has 60% stocks? Right, there's no consistency. Like, in my point is, it, it's a very, very tricky thing. But, you know, when I, when I talk about risk tolerance, I always like understanding risk in terms of uh, risk. Say, say risk, it's more willingness, um, w- willingness. To, yeah. to accept ri- risk, okay, that's more of the what you're talking about, kind of the emotional, yeah. the the personalized, you know, side, of, the behavioral side of things, and then ability to tolerate risk, right? So <laughs> based on what are your financial resources, what are you trying to achieve, and right. understanding the willingness side and the ability side is is very important, and 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 then as that leads into again the client's overall 
picture of what what's their what are their withdrawal needs, what are their what's their time horizon, what's their tax situation. Like there's a lot that a lot more that goes into the investment allocation and portfolio construction process than just saying, hey, give me a, a five question risk quiz and right. you know, all of a sudden, bam, you know, you're moderate aggressive and here's your mix of stocks and bonds. It, it just doesn't that's not even realistic today, which is really tricky for people. No, I, I'm with you on that 100. percent And and we what we have found is that like we are continually having the risk conversations because you know I mean let's go back let's go back if you will to 2017 where you know the market for the most part was in an uptrend almost all year long and you know there was very little volatility it was kind of like the utopian uh, investment environment for a lot of people. And then you go into 2018 where, you know, we had the dip in February, a little drawdown, some volatility, then some, re- then some recovery up into the early parts of the summer. And then we started to have that skid. And then I think most people uh, have December burned into their mind, you know, with how, and it's like you have a, this reminder of how volatile the market could be. And I think if you were to talk to people um, December, 2017, and say, you know, how do you feel about risk and, you know, taking risk in the market? And how do you, and then you would talk to those same people December 2018, they would, you probably get some different answers from the same people just because, um, you know, a lot of folks, they judge their portfolio and how it's doing versus on, you know, they look at the bottom number on the statement and they say, did I, is it, is it greater or less than what it was last month? Sure. And instead of looking at, how their portfolio or their allocation is doing in context of what's actually happening. Sure. Well, you're kind of touching on this idea of benchmarking. I mean, I think benchmarking in general is, it's kind of like risk. I mean, it's this very nebulous, uh, you know, this nebulous concept. I mean, when, when people evaluate their performance. So hold up, let me stop you. So you mean to tell me that, when someone's got a 60-40, uh, you know, stocks to bonds mix, they shouldn't be benchmarking to the S&P 500? Ready, go. Well, um, <laughs> the answer to that is, uh, is, is no, they shouldn't. <laughs> you know, but, but that's, that's, what we, that's what we encounter. I mean, people right. see the S&P, they see the Dow, they see these indexes mm-hmm. very heavily publicized, and they kind of draw the conclusion that that is a rough general benchmark of, investors sure. across the you know the country and and it's just it's really not true especially as you were you know mentioning Ross like we we work with a lot of these clients that are in that retirement uh, era right. of their lives they're not anywhere close to being S&P 500 investors you know it's just that that's probably the furthest from where they should be it doesn't mean they don't have any exposure there but they're definitely not all there and so benchmarking it's tricky i mean Media is is pushing people, uh, either consciously or not, to look at these different indexes. Um, investors have a bit of an addiction to look at those benchmarks because they're so readily available. It's like d- every day they like want their fix. Like what's yeah. the what's, what's the, the S&P? Yeah. And and we did we we actually had. <laughs> I, I, I we mean, had I'm, I'm I got addicted, an email I'm to it. I'm I looking got, at it right now on my phone. I just can't help. I myself. got an email not that long ago, and it and it was basically the reference was made to like a daily bull market, like a one day we're in a bull market today. Yeah. <laughs> and Ross and I, we were just like, oh man, you know, because it's you. We still, it's like once you feel like you've come pretty far with like. You know, you know, people are getting it. You go back to, and it's kind of like what you said. Um, you know, in the presentation, you know, we were doing, you know, you were doing the other night. It was, you know, you stopped yourself and you said, "Wait a minute, I've been spending a lot of time talking about interest rates and fixed income. Does everybody in here understand the difference between a stock and a bond?" Mm-hmm. And you know, we, I think one one failure that we do have and that made me think about that last night as i was you know driving home i was thinking about it what you said um is that we study this and are in this on a daily basis and we're constantly um reading and digesting different research and new stuff and you know we're not thinking about like the you know the executive or the 
or the the young family or you know your average you know everyday person that's like they're not, they know they need to save for retirement but their world is completely focused on something else and right. so they're they're trying to like go in and do the right things but then if you sat them down and said okay explain the difference between you know this and this they'd be like huh yeah you, you know and it's Absolutely. like we we take that for granted a lot i think that we just you yeah. know stuff that's everyday common sense for us you know, we, we, we re- don't realize how little people right. actually know. Well, and that's, again, I mean, coming back to the dialogue around, around risk, it, that's, it's, it's no fault of investors or anybody else. It's just we, we have to have an appropriate understanding of, of what is risk and, more importantly, how do we manage risk. Right. And coming back to market timing and other, other strategies mm-hmm. that are, you know, it's so easily being pushed out there and marketed out there. It's such a great story, right? That, you know, we have these portfolios or this algorithm or this strategy to, to navigate. It's, it's, it's an easy thing to play into, right? right with investors, but just for, from an investor perspective, it's a wrong way of doing right. the, the risk management thing. There are other strategies that can be used to appropriately manage risk. Um, and it's risk management is, a, is, is an extremely important thing for, for investors. It just has to be done the right way. And to your point, it's just these aren't things that are on the minds of uh, everyday, every, everyday people. Um, so that's our job to, to help shed a little bit more light around that. What's up, everyone? We hope you enjoyed part one of our interview with Steve Ostrink Jr. And don't forget to check out part two. Talk to you soon.